it here since it's top of the hour. Okay. Um, so uh, glad everyone can join today. My name is Mike Jeffy. I'm the current chair of the Bay Area GRSS chapter, joint chapter. Um, and I have the pleasure of welcoming um, Joseph Kellendorfer. Um, he's the president founder of Earth Big Data, and he's gonna present his research um, using Sentinel-1 data. Um, and uh, why don't you go and uh, take it away? Uh, so, so just a sort of general, um, we'll, I think our talk will be around 30 to 40 and we can kind of, if we can save our kind of questions until the end, um, feel free to, to put them in the chat window. Um, but um, I think it, it'll be better if we can address them at the end and I'm happy to just read them out loud or have you um, read them uh, at, the, at the right time. Okay, take it away. Well, thanks, Mike, uh, for hosting me on this uh, uh, webinar for the Bay Area. Um, it's always great to share news that I think are worthy on how we make progress on, on SAR processing. Um, I've been at it for more than 30 years, dating myself now, um, in SAR processing, and it's, it's coming full circle. I started out with my diploma thesis working on time series analysis from the commissioning phase data from ERS-1. So in 1991 was when that sensor got launched and we did an agricultural application trying to see if there's a time series signal uh, um, uh, finding different agricultural uh, planting and harvesting cycles in the SAR data. But back then, of course, it was the era of um, getting magnetic tapes, uh, shipped quarter scenes, uh, local premises, etc. cetera. And, uh, and so we, of course, were data uh, and, and, and compute power restricted on how much we could do. Over the 30 years, uh, it's been amazing how we have made progress. And uh, particularly with the launch of uh, Sentinel-1 and the open data policy that came along with it, um, I think we are in a game-changing situation where we uh, see fantastic new insights into the planet. And however, we need to also digest these data really well. And what's been really wonderful as a co-development in sensor technology, making data available, et cetera, is to have uh, the, the computational resources uh, in the form of cloud computing available to us so we can actually tackle these things. So uh, what I always like to do is start out with some cool SAR images. Uh, one of the uh, cooler ones uh, that I think uh, was acquired uh, in recent years was the mapping of the landfall of Hurricane Florence. Uh, you see the eye here in dark hitting Wilmington. And uh, with a little bit of different enhancements, you see the wave patterns in the lower left. Uh, in the right hand side, you see how big the uh, hurricane has already impacted the land with respect to moisture increase in the, uh, in the yellowish colors. But we also see how Wilmington starts to uh, become blue and flooded uh, in, in these kinds of applications. And those are single date acquisitions that are exciting. And for a long, in a long time, we have actually looked at single SAR images and how exciting they were and what they do in terms of their patterns. Um, but what's become so exciting with the Sentinel data, for example, is time series. And this is a, a little animation I put together where we monitor a, a, a contributory to the Urimaguas River. And we actually are monitoring the breakthrough of the water to what I call then the birth of an oxbow lake. So you'll see here in the center of the image that in the, uh, uh, late 2018, we, boom, we're starting to break through. And you see how actually the, the, the river forms a, a new bed and leaves that oxbow lake uh, behind. That is something we can visualize now because it's SAR data. We see through the clouds. Uh, you probably in this uh, region of the earth, you'd have a hard time see that exact uh, uh, sequence of images with, uh, with optical data because um, we have um, a progress mode here. Because we have um, the cloud penetration here, we, we see these kinds of things. What's critical for all time series processing is that we actually have 
really good pre, uh, pre-processing of the data, accurate calibration, both radiometrically and also in terms of location. Uh, I always think uh, with any remote sensing data, but particularly with SAR processing, it's so critical that we follow the real estate principle, location, 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 when we want to integrate data, right? So we need to do uh, an excellent job in that. And for that, we have developed fully automated uh, cloud scalable processing chains that address these for all the uh, major uh, systems. So um, what's our challenge is that we have a huge SAR data availability today, thanks to open data policies, Sentinel uh, delivers about four terabytes a day these days. Uh, the NISAR mission, we are slated in terms of total science data volume. I think we're talking about about 100 terabytes per day that will come uh, down our pipe there. So we need these cloud-based strategies for the SAR data processing into analysis-ready data streams. And we need also the appropriate visualization and analytic tools to reduce these high spatial temporal resolution data streams into meaningful uh, um, presentation for online and offline of the day. So we need and have the chance now to harness uh, the flexibility and scalability of cloud infrastructure for both the storing and the processing of data, and also leverage uh, this wonderful flexible suite of open source tools that are developed by, for example, Pangeo, QHub and friends for analysis and, and visualization. So when we can do that, when we can harness cloud computing, we can actually process data uh, at, at scales that were uh, even a decade ago or even uh, maybe fewer years ago, uh, limited to uh, big data centers, high performance uh, on-premise compute clusters. But now uh, groups like myself uh, and my team, we can just take uh, and harness the cloud here. So this is an example of a project we did for the European Space Agency as a, a, a CCI Carbon Cycle Initiative, and um, and I worked together with my colleagues at Gamma Remote Sensing, and we processed for one year's worth of data a couple of years ago the entire acquisitions from from Sentinel One and produced such uh, global mosaics that then feed into analysis of biomass of disturbance, et cetera. So a couple of statistics on that particular project, it was about 250,000 Sentinel-1 scenes that we digested. They're all held in the Alaska Satellite Facility DAC. And uh, back then uh, things were still in US East. Now they uh, are, are moved to the Western regions in the buckets. The raw data volume was 275 terabytes. Um, and uh, when we uh, uh, reduced that data set to the output, we generated about 3.5 terabytes. But the exciting thing was scaling it right, we processed that data set in a day and a half back then. And so we had some huge, uh, nice access speeds to do that. Um, so processing and, and generating this data set is one thing, but now also visualizing these things in a meaningful way becomes the next uh, challenge that we uh, want to want to tackle here and 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 so there are some recent advances that I think we can uh, in, that we can take advantage of and in particularly in the entire Python tooling ecosystem so we have very powerful tools that allow us to deal with how we store data and visualize these tools in, in multi-dimensions uh, in the cloud how we can actually have scalable uh, back ends for in, in clusters and how we process these data. And then um, uh, we're using these uh, beautiful developments of Jupyter Notebooks to handle and visualize a lot of these uh, data sets in a very transparent and, and shareable way. So some of the key software components that I think everybody should be aware of today are listed here and I'll, I'll just uh, mention them so that if you haven't come across these tool sets that I think this is where we're heading to embrace these more and more. It's uh, the Pantier community has been instrumental in bringing these forward. And so the keywords here are X-Array, Dask, Czar, Holoviews, and then uh, QHub is a wonderful way to deploy um, 
clusters. So X-Array and Dask and Zar play beautifully together on uh, scalable uh, data sets in, in the, on, on, uh, on Cloud Store and then the entire Holoviews ecosystem for um, very efficient and, and beautiful um, visualization techniques. Um, so we have, uh, I have two examples that I wanted to, to share with you um, on how we use these kinds of tool sets now. Um, one is a, a generation of time series stacks of analysis ready data from Sentinel-1. Um, we're processing the data into the very same uh, tiling scheme as Sentinel-2 and the harmonized Lancet Sentinel-2 data are tiled, which is a military grid reference system tiling scheme. Uh, each tile about 110 by 110 kilometers big in UTM projection. And so we're generating uh, radiometrically terrain corrected Sentinel-1 data that get then uh, added uh, where we have set up daily updating, they get added to the time series stacks and then um, get uh, uh, tiled and, and, and made available. Uh, what you see here on the right hand side is where we have currently a suite of uh, tiles that we have uh, pro processed and continuously update. So that those are tens of thousands of Sentinel scenes. Um, probably close to 100,000 now that get updated there uh, continuously. Um, and, and every day we all have an automated process to, to add to these stacks. The data are in the pipeline, in the processing chain, the data are actually stored and added to the cloud stores um, in ZAR file format, which makes it very efficient and opt, uh, optimized, or that's very optimized for uh, tracking the uh, um, the uh, for, for uh, um, accessing the data. Um, I have a, a live demo on that that I'm going to switch to now. Um, let me see if that's going to work. Um, so I'm going to share screen again oh, and do the Firefox. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Yes, so here I am. Um, and if I could ask the participants maybe to hold off and going to that site for now, I'm not sure how powerful the server is at this point. But uh, I wanted to just say, show you, so I can zoom in to, to, to any of these regions here. And this happens to be a, the tile in Peru. We're looking at the gold mining area of... Uh, um, of that region. And if I click on, on, on one of the points, I'm loading. So I'm accessing now the, uh, the store of the uh, um, on, on cloud. So it's, it's a live stream of the data sets. And, and then we're, we're trying to visualize and see um, how, th how things have changed. So here, for example, you see um, a big change from, a, from the early on time series. Um, uh, I, I can see how Sentinel-1 is visualizing and, and measuring that drop of disturbance from, from primary forests. If I go into the primary forest areas outside that illegal gold mining region, you see actually a fairly stable uh, um, satellite signal uh, with uh, some potential outliers that uh, are um, often re related to super strong uh, tropical uh, um, frontal uh, systems. But uh, in that illegal area, you see actually how we can um, visualize readily these time series. And I can also uh, try to enable an image uh, generation mode. And so I could like pick three, three points in the time series and then see how, how, the, how that area actually looks visually, where by default I'm uh, enabling here a 20 by 20 kilometer uh, view around that, that point. And then uh, what, what the image actually shows us is the, how, how things have uh, actually changed at these three particular dates. So certainly what's red is, has been harvested or disturbed after the first date and in the yellow color after that, that second blue date. And so that allows me to uh, explore the planet in, in, in many of these regions. So one of the projects and 
I'm working with uh, um, closely is with NOAA on a uh, flood monitoring system. And so here we have, uh, we can look at, at uh, areas like the Gulf Coast and look at time series uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of that particular region. And here, here we're actually seeing in these strong uh, uh, um, drops in backscatter, we're actually seeing hurricane related flooding. So if I were to pick these two points here and uh, um, generate the image view, we're actually seeing. Uh, uh, we're actually seeing the uh, the flood impact from from that hurricane where it hit where it hit the coastline. So uh, wherever we have and when we have acquisitions, we can actually uh, look at these kinds of um, data streams for for a variety. Of, of applications. Another example I have uh, pulled together is for uh, the big fire events we had in Australia, uh, um, uh, south of Canberra a couple of years ago. So if I were to just randomly pick a point here where I suspect we had uh, fire disturbing the, the signal, we actually see this again quite clearly in the time series. This is about the date. Um, let me make this a little bit bigger here. So this is about the date when the uh, uh, when the fire started, um, and you see the the change in uh, in backscatter in, in in the disturbance that was resulting from from that fire event. So um, again, I think it's it's a a nice way where we can store data correctly in in a in a powerful format on the cloud, and then have uh, efficient ways to extract them and and things through them. Um, the, the same the same uh, uh, data set that uh, I have here sitting on on the uh, cloud that drive or behind that particular website um, I can then certainly use in a, uh, a different in a different setting and this is now just a view of my, uh, Jupyter notebook that I run on a uh, a, 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 a cluster here on, um, that, that we have uh, enabled to, together with the uh, um, Earth Science Information Partnership. We're running a, a, a Jupyter Hub cluster that allows us to do scalable Kubernetes cluster backends. And so the same tiles and data streams that I have just pulled the data in from on this website, I can certainly pull in into any of these notebooks at, uh, and very efficiently then uh, visualize those in here. So this is a visualization where I have a uh, um, uh, this, this same notebook and I can go, go back and forth and pick my dates of, of uh, um, uh, that I want to compare here. And let's see if that still is active sometimes when you don't work it it seems to want to um, shut down the cluster so but typically what I can do here is uh, have the uh, just a visualization tool and then at the same time also an analytic tools on how to um, uh, get to the data set so that should uh, eventually yeah, here we go so that switches then to that particular date that I was interested in in visualizing and I can do that for the entire tile I can do that for subsets and uh, the it's all based in this X-ray and ZAR uh, uh, technology where with very simple uh, labeled arrays and that's the power of X-ray that I can do data set sub selections where I can take a slice of UTM coordinates and subset my data set and this is this is all it took a whole of use call to visualize a data set. So without going into too much technical detail on here, I just wanted to show you how wonderful it is to have these techniques. Um, okay, switching back to my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, let's go here. Let's see. All right, you guys see the PowerPoint again? Yes. Okay. Yep. Good. 
Um, yeah, so we just went through this demo here. <clears throat> so the second example um, I'm excited about uh, sharing with you is actually this project that we did with uh, JPL uh, on a global Sentinel-1 coherence and backscatter data set. Um, so the JPL solicited a, a call to generate this kind of data set to model seasonal temporal coherence decay uh, primarily in order to support a science performance model for SAR uh, mission planning. And uh, the idea here was that we would take an entire year's worth of Sentinel-1, a single complex data, and cover the globe uh, with wherever we had ascending or descending modes and generate a suite of uh, um, global data sets that then allow, allows JPL and others to uh, um, use these data for particular applications. And the idea was here to generate four seasonal backscatter mosaics. So we have four polarizations at the high latitudes, it's uh, H, H and HV polarizations at the mid or mid and, uh, uh, latitudes uh, and, and low latitudes. We have the, uh, the standard VV and, and VH polarizations. And so we wanna basically generate four seasonal mosaics. So seasons going from the data set was acquired from um, December 1st, 2019 and to uh, November 30th, 2020. Um, so, in, and the four seasons are basically December to February and, and, and so on. Um, but then also in, in each of these seasons, uh, we wanted to generate these uh, coherence estimates from all possible combinations of repeat past coherences up to 48 days. So wherever we had six day repeat, we, we computed all six day combinations in a seasons, all 12 day, 18, et cetera, up to 48 days, or where we had uh, in parts of the globe where we only had 12 day uh, repeat, we would look at uh, all of these combinations, 12, 24, 36, 48. So that is a, that came out to a couple million interferograms that needed to be uh, computed and needed to uh, um, then, uh, turned into uh, um, coherence maps and coherence estimates, seasonal estimates for these periods. And in addition to that, then these data were used to drive a, uh, a coherence decay model, uh, a simple um, exponential decay model that uh, used these data to fit, uh, to fit these uh, individual seasonal coherence metrics. And, and so we generated three parameters of, uh, that describe that model. Also uh, to, to be able to fully understand potential uh, uh, impacts of incidence angle or where we had layover and shadow regions where SAR doesn't see anything, we also wanted to preserve these kinds of, of data sets. So, um, this required uh, on our side, and again, uh, there was a, a, a teaming with uh, gamma remote sensing and, and uh, our team here. And what that required was that we took the and applied the, the, uh, the software from, from gamma that allowed uh, where they developed the, the, the fine tuning of, of all the matching of the bursts and all this complicated uh, selection of, of uh, how we process the data in, in different groups uh, that needed to be then integrated with uh, the cloud scaling uh, solutions. And uh, when we were all said and done and tested and, and deployed the software, we actually ended up and here are the statistics. So we ended up processing about 205,000 single, single look complex data. And you see a little table here that shows the breakout and, and how many scenes we acquired from, from what mode. So the primary, mo primary mode was the descending dual pole mode with 127,000 scenes then compl complemented by the ascending area where we didn't have uh, descending data covering and then the polar regions, et cetera. But what that meant is, and uh, uh, also uh, kudos again to the Alaska satellite facility who is always stellar in supporting this. 
uh, kind of work. I was in close contact with them to make sure we the pipelines were open and uh, everything uh, was smooth. When because we processed essentially next to the data, all the data they hosted are on uh, the uh, um, ASF store in in Sentinel in S3, and so we fired up our processes in next to the data, and so it was about an 840 terabyte raw data volume that we needed to uh, digest. When we scaled it up with about uh, 1,350 instances, uh, we processed uh, with a throughput of about 10 terabytes an hour, uh, which meant we were able to digest this entire data set for the initial uh, um, processing into um, stacked and tiled burst groups, uh, uh, interferograms and backscatter mosaics, et cetera, uh, in about 100 hours. And then we took uh, another four and a half hours with a thousand instances to process this, uh, the model uh, data. So what that uh, uh, meant was ultimately that we had, <clears throat> that we pr produced about 25,000 one by one degree tiles to cover the globe. And for that, uh, and then we had 88 different metrics in these uh, 25,000 uh, tiles. So these uh, wanted uh, data sets actually uh, of, of backscatter and interferograms, uh, I mean, coherence metrics and, and model parameters. So all in all, we produced essentially uh, over 1 million GeoTIFF files, output files, each of the, each of the tiles containing about 88 layers, and then all of that in, in three arc second uh, resolution. Just a, a quick uh, view here on uh, our resource usage. So this shows you the, so the monitoring, how we basically processed in, uh, in these 100 hours, how many uh, CPUs we used. Here's our throughput with about 10 terabytes uh, uh, network in reading data in from ASF. Uh, to process them and then I'll put them back on disk for, for storage. So <clears throat> what that looked like ultimately is uh, you see here a quick uh, global visualization of these maps. Um, so we have uh, the four seasons, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. And this is your global view of how the uh, coherence, the median coherence in these uh, data sets looks like. So uh, if you just want to briefly focus here on, on the African uh, continent, you see in, in the winter, uh, northern winter or southern summer, you see um, how the coherence is fairly low in the areas where you have potential agricultural activities, etc. And then it's fairly high in the, in the Sahel region. And that switches then in the summer when you start to see how, uh, when things are less active agriculturally and, and dynamic moisture are not as dynamic, things are drier. Um, this is the reverse. So just flipping that through briefly as a, a visualization, you actually can see these dynamics uh, just quite nice. Um, globally. So, um, and here is a, a little colorful animation on how these data sets, uh, when we put the backscatter and the uh, coherence in a uh, RGB animation, you can, we, here we put coherence in red and backscatter and backscatter ratios in green and blue, you get a nice global impression on where things are stable and not stable and, and you, you can see already also the uh, relevance to, for example, biomass uh, sensitivity and all these kinds of things. Um, this is a, a tile, one tile that I just wanted to show you briefly when you zoom into that data set. As I said, it's three arc seconds. Um, this is one tile that shows the uh, city of Paris in the upper left there. And, and what's, what's interesting is uh, when we look at winter coherence uh, for six days, um, agricultural areas around Paris and et cetera uh, are highly coherent after six days because there's not much going on. Forests tend to be low all the time. But then if you switch and go to the summer 48 day coherence, the picture is of course such that it's very dynamic and after 48 days, everything that is not 
a uh, permanent scatter like buildings and, 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 and power lines and, and uh, um, other infrastructure that doesn't move, you lose the coherence. And so what you're left with is this kind of basically infrastructure mapper. And so what's very exciting now to me is that uh, uh, A, uh, Mike has uh, been instrumental in helping here getting this data set uh, onto the registry of open data on AWS. Also, ASF has been terrific, and we have host that data set also now. Uh, and, and NASA asked us to, to add the ASF DAC for ensure uh, also the long term storage. And so we have the, this data set now openly accessible for anybody uh, to use. And uh, also, what was exciting is that. Uh, Going back to the tool set of the uh, um, XRA and ZAR, et cetera, um, some really t uh, terrific folks uh, inspired by a, a question by my colleague uh, and friend here, Rich Signal, uh, who is part of the uh, Pangeo team, uh, kicked off and said, well, can we actually take these geotips and virtualize it as a ZAR data set on the disk on, and, 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 and then access it as a single data set. And after some back and forth and discussions and how we can do that, uh, uh, Martin Durand from, from Anaconda, who is behind this new package called uh, Kerchunk, and then Christoph Golke from, from University of Irvine started this chat and, and, and we, we all uh, worked together on it, making it possible to visualize that data set as, as one big data set. And so now switching back again to a live demo. Um, here we go, share. Um, so here is, here is a notebook that we ultimately put together. So, and it's not very long and I'm not gonna go into all the details. I just wanted to show you that with a simple, well, maybe not that simple, but with a short notebook, we can actually access and visualize this entire data set. And so uh, the, the, the one cell in this notebook that I want to point out to you is uh, we have a JSON file describing the data set as a ZAR data set. So it's a simple, yeah, maybe not that simple, but it's a, it's a JSON metadata data set that's, that we put also on that open data store. And then all we need to do is open that JSON file and read it as a ZAR engine uh, file. And, and then we open this data set as one global data set. And what you see here um, is 432,000 longitudes and 193,200 uh, latitudes is your global data set. And we just, it, because it's all delayed processing, this is the metadata of the data set. It has four seasons, four polarizations, six coherence entries, two flight directions, and 175 orbits for these various parameters. And you see, we have the coordinates, are these different uh, uh, parameters that are applicable to these various data variables that we wanted, the amplitude, coherence, instance angle, et cetera. So, and then again, with one call, we're now opening and accessing this global data set. And then with a little more wizardry on how we can actually get to this uh, visualization of that data set with some masking, we can ultimately um, uh, build a website that uh, here I show inside, inside the notebook um, and goes uh, and, and shows us uh, some of these uh, parameters. But the beauty is um, because of the uh, powerful techniques of hollow views and panel, et cetera, I can actually make this a servable entity now that I can actually put on a web server. And so now I'm just switching tabs here the same notebook drives now a global uh, a global website here. Uh, by default, you see uh, Cape Cod. Uh, 
could I just found that fun <laughs> to always look there, but it, anybody can change these uh, default locations easily. But basically what we're looking at is uh, we have our set of variables that we can switch between. We have our slider of the coherences and then uh, polarizations, etc. Let me drive uh, briefly this uh, this website uh, um, and and show you how we actually uh, go about and and then uh, can use it. So here I have uh, just before the talk. Uh, um, preloaded uh, uh, and zoomed into Paris. So what I can do is um, with the tools, I can, I can certainly zoom around, around the planet here and I can actually uh, see in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the map, I see the coverage of uh, where do I have globally the six day repeat uh, data available to me. If I switch this to 12 days, and it takes a couple of seconds here to, to readjust, but then we basically see this is where the 12 day repeat coverage of the planet is. And if I switch this to the HH polarization, it shows me where do I have the HH data uh, covering the planet, etc. And so I can, I can basically see where do I have in this global data set uh, uh, data available. And, and then get myself to zoom into any spot and say, uh, I want this. So for, for example, here, I've preloaded the coherence for, uh, um, for, uh, um, the, the, for Europe uh, in the, uh, um, hang on. So this is, should be the winter. Let me go back and load. This is the winter coherence um, for six day repeat uh, with Paris in the center there. So we're just loading the, the, the data set in. Um, and, it's, and, then, and you see a, a fairly in the winter, uh, 12 days. If I go to six days, I probably get a little higher, higher coherence even um, that shows me uh, what, what's going on over over Europe in the winter here, and uh, and it, again, imagine this is basically the virtualization of the entire global data set because of of one uh, access point now. Yeah, so a little higher. And if I were to switch this coherence now, let's say we go to the summer and we want to see forty eight day coherence from the Paris example earlier, we would expect coherence to go way down because of all the agricultural activity. Uh, after 48 days, not much is going on. And what we're left with is probably all the cities and infrastructure that uh, uh, we will visualize here. And, and sure enough, that's, that's what the, you see as this uh, impression of, of that data set. And as I said, uh, we can pretty much uh, get ourselves into uh, any, any part of the, of the world. And since we're, since we're here in the uh, uh, um, San Francisco uh, Bay Area uh, as a host of, of this webinar, let's just uh, pick, pick that region and, 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 uh, and visualize it. So uh, if I click, I think, oh yeah, here we go. So this goes in and uh, I put my cursor there and, and uh, here I go, load now the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And this is now the summer 48 day coherence. And again, I could go back and say that. Again, go back and say that. 12 days and, and, and reload that. And, and, and then get some feedback now. And, and it basically streams in that kind of coherence. And as a, with, within some reason, I tested it out. It's not quite the server behind it uh, that I have launched is not quite uh, powerful enough yet to stream in the entire globe. But like within reason, you can do five, five degrees uh, by five degrees easily to, to zoom out and, and stream, these, stream these data in. 
So this notebook um, is available uh, openly now. We share that. It's um, uh, at the end of the presentation, and now I switch back to my PowerPoint. Um, uh, basically, uh, that is all available, and uh, I'll, I'll give you the. Oops, to get to my PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. Um, so we set a, a, a quick out, outlook here, and I'll share the resource where this notebook is available. Uh, I always like to talk about what makes SAW remote sensing so exciting, and 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 really this empowerment of time series now, um, because it's an all weather mapping system. We at any time in any weather system, pretty much, uh, we because we micro risk parent cloud, we get a measurement on the ground. And that measurement, uh, and we can do that at all seasons. Um, and also, so because it's active, we can look at dynamics at Arctic winters and uh, ice dynamics. Because it's a fully coherent active remote sensing technology, we have this uh, fantastic uh, uh, power of measurement of phase and magnitude of a single, which enables the whole science and application of interferometry and coherence that we just saw, but also the backscatter that I've shown you in the remote sensing of Earth, uh, we can calibrate this data very accurately over space and time. So typically within uh, some small system uh, noise margins, we, are, we know that the changes, uh, if the elimination geometries are the same, the changes on the ground are related to, if we simplify it to the structure and moisture changes the dielectricity. And so that really makes it such an invaluable tool for monitoring the planet and uh, the science applications, uh, application natural resource management, policy uh, decisions at, at local and global scale. I think it's, it's just phenomenal how this is now our era where we can do this. And we have, of course, big plans with the NISAR mission um, where uh, we know we're getting uh, bigger data sets and uh, a different frequency L band that will uh, complement what uh, Sentinel does with C band. We have uh, nice uh, movements out of Japan, I think, with uh, more open data access from ALOS in the future. Um, but it's exciting because the cloud and the tools can meet the challenge. Uh, my last outlook <laughs> to everybody, learn to speak Python. So um, with that, uh, some contact info here for, for uh, how Earth's big data, my colleague, um, Carlos Petraza works with me in Latin America. And down there is a link on GitHub. If you search for open SAR and Earth's big data, you'll actually find the resources for this uh, um, uh, website that I've just shown you, the global uh, uh, coherence data set visualization. So, um, with that, I'm concluding and happy to answer some questions. So thank you, Joseph. Very, very that was exciting. a great talk. Um, I think some questions started kind of streaming in um, at the top of the hour in the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to sort of take a look and start. Um, okay. That uh, seemed to be some of them were being addressed by different participants. Um, so I think take a look here. Um, the notebooks being found on GitHub. Um, there was <clears throat> also if anybody does have a question, feel free to kind of uh, um, unmute yourself and ask it. I think um, perhaps oh, the go ahead. Oh, in, in the absence of any other, just thank you. That, that was just tremendous. Um, who, who is that talking? Richard Olson, uh, retired faculty from the West Coast. Um, Hi, Richard. Just thought it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Africa. Oh, hi, Africa. Thanks for coming in. This great presentation, Joseph, and amazing job. This is just great. I really love the map that you have on your back. Uh, this global map that has uh, 
coherence included and uh, other information. Did, did you mention that this is freely available as well? Yes, yes, actually on the, uh, if you go to the uh, Registry for Open Data or to the ASF uh, DAC site, there is in that global data set, uh, there are the individual tiles accessible, but also all these mosaics pre-computed. So you can download uh, or better even access in the cloud, these uh, uh, global mosaics, but these are pre-computed, I think uh, at a somewhat lower resolution, um, but it's all described on there. Uh, if you go to that uh, registry of open data, there's a documentation of the data set and that has also a documentation on how these global mosaics are available. Perfect, thank you so much. And this is for 2018? This is, this is the data were acquired from December 1st, 2019 to November 30th, 2020. Oh, okay. So it's last, last year sort of. Yeah. Have a, I have a um, question. Uh, this is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mike, did I? Uh, no, I was going to introduce your question. So good timing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I actually asked a question at the beginning, but then I realized what's the added value com compared to Google Earth Engine. And I'm actually, congratulations for this presentation. I wanted to give a little bit of background. This this all started at JPL. Uh, I'm Pietro Milino. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Houston. I just started here, but before I was working at JPL. And uh, I think this project started from the SDC, Surface Information and Change uh, project uh, at, at JPL. And um, one of the additional I idea that uh, that we had there was to generate a coherent math map but also fit a model to it like a, <clears throat> a temporal decorrelation model like a decaying explanation I, I was wondering if uh, I, I think you mentioned it but it was not clear to me did you also fit the model the exponential decay in order to retrieve the the, yes. the decay, decay time or uh, yeah, yeah absolutely that was uh, I, I didn't show it as a visualization but you can actually uh, I could have switched to the uh, three model parameters, rho, tau, and RMSC. So yeah, we did, yeah. no, no, that was definitely yeah. part of the work was uh, fitting the decay models in yeah. each season. And we have global maps for that. Yeah. So, and, and those are in the Amazon uh, web link that they shared in the chat, right? Uh, uh, I, I left JPL a, a year ago, but I'm excited that this project has been implemented. It's like such a great work. And I'm curious to see if uh, it's, uh, are those the tau freely available as well? Everything's freely available. The tiles, and, the mosaics, the, yeah. Uh, so it, yeah. Another quick question. The initial idea was to use the SLTM um, coherence at time zero in order to help the fit. But I was wondering, did what kind of model do you use? Did you use uh, a gamma zero at time zero equals one, or you also infer that the gamma at, uh, at time zero, which would be the volumetric decorrelation? No, we did not do a SRTM based uh, uh, in initialization. It's essentially uh, all the coherence pairs inside that uh, season were used as a, a levenberg markward uh, fit of, of a logarithmic decay model. It's a simple exponential decay model. And that's actually described also on that uh, website. Okay. Okay. So basically, if you look at that model at time zero, you should have the volumetric decorrelation for uh, the C-band in theory. In theory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yeah, Joseph, I've probably lost track of the questions in the chat, but um, feel free for people to, uh, uh, to sort there's of a, and There's ask. a question on what elevation data set do you use for terrain correction for high latitudes north of 60 degrees? We actually, for, the, for this project, we use the um, Copernicus uh, 90 meter DM that is globally uh, available. And for the for the uh, uh, higher resolution processing that I do, for example, on the uh, remote sensing Earth, twenty meter data stacks, we use the thirty meter Copernicus DM, which also are of course available uh, for free and online in the web stores on on on, on S three. So, but for this project, we use the uh, consistently the Copernicus DM. Let's see what other questions. Um, 
Um, Bradley Gay had a question. Um, I think, would it be prudent to compare SAR microwave and field spatiotemporal data output, namely features derived from soil moisture and topography to understand the relationship between the different measurements with differing scales, or will this endeavor be a non-starter because of some of these platform method methods measure different things? Okay, I think I'm not, I didn't quite, uh, okay, I see it here, random question. We've really compared SAR. Mm -hmm. No, no, it is prudent. It's always prudent to compare uh, uh, SAR measurements and moisture measurements because it is, uh, of course, a, there's a strong correlation between, as I said, structure and moisture and the SAR signal, in a sense. And the time series show this so very clearly. Uh, if, uh, I mean, I haven't uh, shown all the examples, but for example, if you go to the high latitudes and, and, and pick points in, in the uh, boreal region, you can clearly see also free saw cycles where soils are frozen for that period and there's a fast, uh, a rapid melt or short melt period and then you start to see uh, higher backscatter, etc. So it's, it's quite fascinating to see also these uh, temporal uh, signatures. Um, yeah. That's exactly what I was getting at, Yosef. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, then there's a question on, can you speak to a general migration from sigma naught to gamma naught in recent SAR research? Do you think that sigma naught is becoming obsolete with more accurate elevation models? Do you think gamma naught is becoming a new standard? Uh, great question, uh, uh, thank you, Melanie. I think uh, I, I give the classic scientists a preface to an answer, it depends. Um, it depends on your application. There's certainly still applications where uh, uh, sigma naught is wanted. Um, I, know, I know that some of the ICE applications prefer that sometimes um, to see that. But in general, for land-based applications, those of us who are dealing with biomass estimations, disturbance, etc., uh, because we take out the uh, uh, um, sigma naught inherent uh, um, uh, elevation and slope, et cetera, uh, basically scattering area factor, we, 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 we normalize that. Because of that, we are uh, vastly preferring now uh, to, to do a gamma knot uh, calibration. And that makes these uh, images uh, across slopes, et cetera, very smooth. Well, thank you um, for that. Uh, this is Melanie, if you can Hi, hear Melanie. me. Yeah, so um, why then would we even keep sigma naught for ice applications? I use ice, I, I use SAR for ice applications, it's freshwater ice. So um, what's the redeeming factor of keeping sigma naught then for, uh. for ice applications? It's, it's, it's a good question. I have to admit, that's not, I'm not, quite clear and it was just uh, uh, some of the discussions I uh, was recently involved in that we, we think it's it, sometimes you just see uh, um, uh, you want boundaries more visible let's say if you have if you can if you can uh, um, yeah I guess it comes it comes down to do, do you do, are you more interested in seeing still terrain-based features uh, and, and, and slope boundaries, et cetera, in, in the imagery or not. And uh, so I'm sorry, I can't probably give you quite a clear answer on that. But... Oh, you gave me a fantastic answer for off the cuff and I enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, yeah. Add something to uh, the sigma knot and gamma knot discussion. Yeah, the sigma knot is basically because uh, legacy issue is there. There are a lot of theories and models which use sigma knot and not gamma knot. And particularly even soil moisture measurements and all, uh, there are a lot of models which use sigma knot. So again, going back to the basic uh, data set and converting them to gamma knot is a huge task. So there's legacy issues there. So continue to use sigma knot. Gamma naught is good for 
contextualization, yes, normalization. But uh, when it comes to uh, model application, sigma naught is still as powerful as. And by the way, there's only a sine theta uh, uh, factor is there. It's the tan theta and this is sine theta. Uh, beta naught sine theta and this is beta naught tan theta. So there's hardly a difference. And this is angle when you correct by terrain correction and other things, uh, they're almost equivalent. Okay. Thank you for that contribution. Any other questions? Yeah, a few came in after Melanie's, um, Anatole as well, um, and Carlos um, Lopez. Those are sort of towards the bottom. Okay. Let's see, so here's a question. Okay, great work. Uh, consider releasing the six day coherence time series directly. Um, no, we have not considered it. Also, we retained it. Um, then the other one is, could you tell us today, using insight, is it possible to monitor subsidence of the Earth's surface in real time? Um, well, real time is, is, is always a, a, a good question, but um, I mean, there's certainly, yes, applications um, where INSAR is used as close to uh, as possible to to uh, monitor subsidence so we and it's one of the big discussions we're also having is how fast are we going to release data uh, when they become available for rapid response uh, activities but yes uh, certainly insar methods are used to monitor subsidence and as close as possible then maybe i missed it but are the sentinel slcs available on s3 for doing this kind of cloud processing or does the data need to be downloaded first from the East or the Alaska Santa facility? Um, I don't think the SLCs are on the registry of open data, right, Mike? I, but so, you, but they're certainly uh, freely and openly available through both the East of Copernicus Hub and the Alaska Satellite Facility. Yeah, on the uh, open data registry, we have the cloud optimized GeoTIFF uh, coherence and backscatter maps. Um, I do not believe we have the SLC data, uh, although there are some other SLC data sets, uh, the Indigo Ag, um, which actually is an analysis ready backscatter oh, data set. Yeah, exactly. It's not yeah. a SLC. No, yeah, not, it's not, not SLC. The raw SLCs are, are, are not available. And, yeah. And it's, it, it's really also questionable if that makes sense for, for processing purposes, because you can stream those in from both the Sentinel Hub and the Alaska Satellite Facility. Um, and those are huge volumes, right? I mean, we one year's worth of, and we did we only out of three hundred thousand that would have been available, we we processed two hundred five thousand SLCs for one year, and that was eight hundred fifty terabytes of data. So, um, okay, uh, okay. The question was, what technologies and tools did you use in the pre-processing as one step? So, um, yeah, so it's basically a uh, gamma software that is integrated with our uh, um, cloud scaling in-house software that we scale up and then we harness a lot of the open source tools, uh, GDAL, and then these tools I mentioned here, X-Array uh, for, for the pre-processing. Um, then is your DM basis is 30, do, uh, does that tin the net limit your availability to do this kind of work at higher spatial resolution? Um, so yeah, if you wanted to, I mean, it's always uh, the question on how, how well do you calibrate data with at, at what resolution. Um, from a global consistent point of view, the Copernicus uh, 30 meter DM has been a, a tremendous contribution and push forward the release of that, having that globally available. Certainly, if you wanted to process at finer resolution and have a finer resolution DM available and you work locally, then by all means, that's what we uh, should do and could do if that uh, uh, makes, makes it uh, uh, better calibrated. But it's always a trade off also between consistency of these uh, um, DMs 
in, in processing data because with every DEM change, you potentially introduce then a locational uh, uh, a mismatch, right? Uh, so you want, to, it's one of the big questions is uh, what, what's, for, where do you freeze potentially the DM to, to process data with? Um, ideally, if we had a nicely nested uh, DM like this 30 to 90 meter Copernicus, and if we had a finer resolution that nests in that, we, we, we could then use that for the finer resolution processing. But um, the switch from SRTM to Copernicus was a, a, an important step also, because we also, of course, 20 years or 15 years after uh, SRTM to use, to use that data set in SRTM, which was a game changer back then in the 2000s, how we can do global processing up to the 50, 60 degree limit area. Um, now we are the next generation with new DMs. And um, I, I assume this will, will continue. We'll get finer and more open. And, and so I think we'll, we'll keep looking at that, how to do, but for now, I think for the next couple of years, uh, the Copernicus DM is probably our, our standard against which to process and calibrate the data sets. Well, thank you, Joseph. Um, we're at the top of the hour here. Um, really appreciate your time. It was a great presentation. Um, this will be available on the GRSS uh, YouTube channel when it's completed. Um, there's some processing. So again, thank, thank you everyone for joining and uh, uh, looking forward to future research in this area. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for hosting me and uh, uh, all the participants who, who uh, dropped by and, and listen to this. Thank you. And yeah, check out the website. If you have any questions, of course, feel free to email me, joseph at earthspeakdata.com. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.